So uh, just a little bit about Dr. Burgess before we start. Um, Dr. Burgess is a consultant clinical psychologist who has previously worked as a mental health counselor with people with psychiatric disorders, substance, di substance addiction, before he returned to postgraduate education in combined integrated clinical counseling and school psychology. He then went on to work in the NHS, first in Leicester and later back in London. Dr. Burgess developed and validated spans on the job, working with a variety of neurological patients on inpatient rehabilitation wards and outpatient clinics. He is currently at the University of Leicester as a lecturer in clinical psychology. So that kind of leads us into just talking about where we're going to go with this webinar today. Um, Firstly, we'll cover the background of the SPANS, and I think Dr. Burgess will give you a little bit more about uh, the design aims, the clinical utility of the SPANS, as well as the most frequently asked questions, or in this case, really the most frequently asked question, which is how is the SPAN different from the R bands? Um, we'll also talk about the plans for extension and further exploration of the validity, and we'll then open up to Q&A. Uh, just a little note about the Q&A um, area. Uh, do hold your questions to the end for spoken questions, but I'm more than happy to take written questions throughout, so uh, please do write in as you have questions, and we'll make sure to feed those back as we, at the end there. Um, great, and finally, uh, just for the last bit that you'll hear from me for now, I did want to give you a visual of the SPANS kit and a few details about the launch of the assessment, which occurred back in July 2014. Uh, the development and launch of this assessment was actually a true labor of love for the team here at Hographer, from working with Dr. Burgess all the way down through to designing the SPANS logo and even deciding which stopwatch was appropriate for the kit. For instance, nothing that would beep or distract the patient. The kit contains all the materials needed to run the parallel versions. Um, and at that, I think to give you further detail on the development of the kit, I'll pass you now over to Dr. Burgess, who will introduce you to the SPANS. Bear with me just one second, and I will pass you right over. All right, Dr. Uh, yes, thank you, Jamie. Uh, yes, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. So um, just to say one more thing about, about the SPANS index scores, as you see there, uh, this is ultimately is where the SPANS has ended up after, after uh, several years of development. Um, it has these um, seven reliable index scores, but let me tell you the story of, of how the um, SPANS came to be. Um, as Jamie said, I, I started my career working in adult and child mental health. And I came into clinical psychology later in my career, and specifically to, to work in neuropsychology. And I had administered hundreds of neuropsychological tests, mostly for um, uh, research with people with uh, movement disorders. And I had, as part of my clinical psychology training, I had worked uh, at a memory clinic for older adults. And um, this that we see pictured here is uh, very much like what was my first job as a doctor of, uh, clin in clinical psychology. It was a brain injury um, rehabilitation uh, inpatient unit that looks very much like this one. And when I first started, I kind of wondered how I was going to do my job, essentially. Um, to work on a ward like this, it required um, the ability to do an assessment by uh, bedside. Um, it was helpful if it was comprehensive to get uh, everything that may be may have happened in an acquired sort of a sense that, that people on this ward had brain injuries. Um, I found myself with a number of choices that, that none of them were all that good, really, that I could have used a short battery that was designed ori originally for uh, dementia assessment. Um, a lot of these tests, though, did not have very good uh, subtest selection, and furthermore, uh, some were not normed down to people in their 20s or even late teens, which has uh, made up a large portion of my patients who I saw on this ward. Um, 
Uh, on the ward, what we mostly saw was traumatic brain injury um, and hydrocephalus, intracranial pressure, hemorrhage and hematoma and aneurysm. So what I was working with then mainly is people with focal damage to a specific part of the brain that may have uh, spread or gotten worse by a secondary event or something of that nature, uh, or uh, a diffuse axonal injury from a high-speed crash or uh, fight or fall down the stairs or something of that nature. So there was, there was a very wide variety of cases that were seen, a lot of neuropsychological presentations, and I found in working with um, on this ward, these uh, referral questions that are up now were the most common that I received. Uh, anyone who works on neurorehabilitation, I'm sure these will look very familiar. And um, I needed essentially to answer those those questions. I found that these were the general areas that were useful to um, evaluate about my patients, that they were orientated, how well could they sustain attention, practical things like reading and writing. Um, these were all the things that were very helpful, and this was backed up by a literature search, um, a content analysis essentially, in which I looked at, at um, what is the most often, or you know, most naturally occurring following many types of acquired brain injury. And you see on the list on the right there, there's a number of uh, cognitive domains that are in order of their mention, that memory is, is almost always impaired, followed by problems with processing speed, attention, executive functioning, visuospatial language, and orientation. And particularly when talking about stroke, uh, neglect was also mentioned, and aphasia and agnosias. Um, these are furthermore broken down into areas uh, that we know that no cognitive domain is uh, unitary in, in the sense that it's not just one thing. It has various uh, levels of um, function for us, uh, like for attention, we either focus our attention or we have more broader, wider attention. Language is both expressive and receptive. Uh, the perceptual domain, you know, we're looking at what and where, and there are many different ways that uh, a memory may not be made. And we know from, mostly we, we've learned about the brain from people who have had very specific kind of almost sensationalized, in a sense, focal damage in which just one thing has gone wrong. And through uh, brain scans, we've been, been able to place where in the brain a particular function occurs or perhaps follow, follow following a surgery. And most uh, events on um, a brain injury ward or patients that we see, the picture is not is not quite that sorry is not quite that neat. Sorry, I'm I'm moving my hands. I'm talking with my hands and giving the wrong cue there. Sorry about that. Um, most of these are not uh, that well defined and set, and most uh, people's neuropsychological presentation is messy. However. What I thought is that it's useful to uh, include subtests in any new test development that included essentially all of these areas because it can also be unclear how in a person's everyday life, uh, if they, for example, have difficulty with identifying where something is or where they are in space or, or what an object is or uh, they can remember things if they learn it, but they have trouble learning because of difficulties with attention or applying a executive um, sort of rules or strategies to help remember something. So as I was developing the, the, the spans, I made sure that I focused on all of these areas and looked at traditional ways to um, create subtests that 
tapped into assessing these items and then created original items and put together uh, the first prototype of this band. And I found along the way that um, one of the key aspects as we saw uh, amongst the referral, uh, the common referrals that I would receive on the ward, is that one was asking or anticipating or trying to figure out what uh, the trajectory of someone's recovery may be. And this, of course, is an important question um, next to uh, would someone benefit from rehabilitation? Are they actually improving? Are they getting better? Uh, do we spend the money to um, essentially provide these services for them? And it turns out there, there are three kinds of tests or assessments that, that predict this really quite well. One is the period of time how long someone has been disorientated following their injury. Uh, this, of course, includes coma plus times in post-traumatic amnesia where they, they, they don't track events from day to day. And you ask them at one certain point and they, you know, they are disorientated still. They're not, they're not making new memories yet. So that's sort of an area of coma. The longer that lasts, it tends to suggest the more serious um, someone's brain injury is and tends to predict worse outcomes as time goes on. Um, another type of test is one like we might find in several different types of tests. Probably the most popular is the Wechsler intelligence scales, like this coding one that we see here. So tests that, that have, a, have a time limit, time pressure, uh, require uh, visuomotor coordination and speed and sustained attention and appreciation of time that from the beginning to end they need to stay on a task. And essentially what this, what this does is that one, one after the other, the numbers correspond to a symbol that, you, that uh, the patient place in the blank spot down below. And they, they're, they're instructed to complete this as quickly as possible and they're given one minute or two minutes or whatever the time may be to complete it. So something about, about what's required here, the, you know, the working memory, the visual motor aspects, these all predict uh, future outcomes quite well. So in designing the spans, I wanted to make sure that I got uh, tests that converged with this, that correlated well with, with, a, with tasks such as this. The third type of assessment is um, story memory or memory for a story. So this, this certainly adds the memory element, uh, the learning element, the delayed memory element of hearing a story that has some social significance, it has some intrigue, um, it uh, requires again sustained attention and, and paying attention and then being able to tell back the story that you've just been told, plus retaining it for 30 minutes and being able to tell the story again. So again, something, something about, about this test is also a massive, uh, very good predictor. So again, I wanted to um, include in this band subtests that, that converged with, with uh, uh, memory for stories, like you might find in uh, the WIMS 3. And uh, at the time that the SPANS was developed, it was the WASTE 3 and the WIMS 3. Of course, those are both now in version 4. But as you see here, uh, the SPANS VPI, that stands for Visio um, Motor Performance Index, and the SPANS MLI, that's the Memory and Learning Index. As you see, uh, this seemed to have worked. The items that I included seemed to converge uh, this was the highest correlation. Uh, in a validity correlation, it's considered above 0 0.50 as being very good. And so you see that, that the spans, um, these two ind indices uh, exceeded um, sort of good enough expectation of converging with these uh, very reliable gold standard tests that are very good at predicting future outcomes. And uh, the SPANS does it in a much more concise, tighter way. Um, another aspect of that 
I hoped to achieve was, was that um, setting item difficulty is always a very interesting and challenging challenge to take, take place to try and achieve. Essentially, one needs to make sure that, that uh, items are not so easy that they provide basically useless information. And that, like a normally, normal healthy control, you don't want your patients to top out or ceiling on their responses to an item that you present to them. Similarly, you don't want an item or a subtest to be so long or so difficult that actually of the normal, healthy, wide range that human beings exhibit, you don't want to uh, begin to make items so difficult that actually you get, you get too many people who do not have brain damage not being able to pass your test. So it's about setting um, your item difficulty at a very sort of precise point in which it's meaningful. And a heuristic that I used was two aspects, really. I looked at what I could know about tests that generally people who score between, in the general population, between about the 25th to 37th percentile. Uh, these are walking, talking, healthy, independently living people um, who, if you give them an IQ test or a neuropsychological test, they tend to score between the 25th and the 37th percentile. This was the level of item difficulty that I decided to set to the best of my ability. And that way, if um, an inpatient passed it, what would be suggested is that generally this person has some fairly uh, able uh, cognitive abilities and functions that they can use that will probably get them by, um, you know, fairly reasonably, though they have had a brain injury. The second heuristic that I used is that there are what, what are called universal norms. And essentially, if you have a healthy brain, with these tests that have universal norms, it challenges you, but essentially you pass it. And if a person's brain is compromised in any way in receptive language and expressive language in concentrating, in perceiving something correctly, these subtests with the universal norms, they're going to they're going to challenge and it's going to be sensitive and pick up um, the problem. So I have this, this slide up here that, that shows uh, three different levels um, of scores across the SPAN's seven indices. And reported there are the means and standard deviations, and in the far right is the possible number of points that can be scored on each of those index scores. So what you can see essentially is that, that people who have had an injury uh, within the past year score the lowest. People who have had a brain injury or have some other long-term neurological condition such as multiple sclerosis um, score somewhere in the middle. And then we have the uh, norm healthy control population, how they scored with uh, means and standard deviations. So you see that that uh, statistically, all of these um, discriminated to a statistically significant level. And uh, these are also very clinically significant findings and uh, would suggest that the SPANS achieved its aim of item difficulty being uh, just right, that it appears to serve a good function of identifying people uh, with or without um, brain injury. Um, another aspect that was important in the, in the SPANS design was that it, it is often uh, helpful or useful um, in any type of neuropsychological assessment, mostly though in neuro rehabilitation inpatient, and we could, we could add as well in dementia assessment that what is required is a time to uh, test initially, uh, 
and then after some period of time passes, then to test again. Now, therein lies a problem that, that if you use this exact same test for the first testing point and the second testing point, particularly um, anything that has to do with learning and memory or executive functioning, uh, they traditionally have extremely poor test, retest, reliability coefficients because essentially on the first go-round, on the first assessment, uh, the patient was exposed to the content of the memory test and to the novelty of the executive functioning test. So essentially that's been, that's been blown. Uh, you you know they have they have seen the content they may have residual memories and not by a matter of their own cognitive skill and ability have they shown that they can do better on a on a second retest um, but instead they remembered or have solved the problem from the previous test from the previous testing session now what what is uh, a problem, though, if, if, if you move to an alternative version, is that, that the two versions do have to be uh, very much alike. So when an alternative parallel version is developed, it has to have the same instructions, it has to have the same amount of time, it has to have the same demand, it has to have the same syllable length, it has to have the same number of lines, it has to have, you know, painstakingly, you need to develop uh, a uh, alternative version that that provides equal demand. The slide that's up now shows um, in the table on the left what is seen is uh, are the means of a sample of 38 uh, stable neurological patients. So when I say stable, I mean that their condition I could suggest hadn't, wouldn't have changed between point one testing and point time two testing. And these are their means and standard deviations across uh, the first administration of SPANS A and the second administration of SPANS B. And what, what we see here is that, that actually the, the means are very, very close to each other as well as the, the variance that we see across these 38 people. So that's, that's our initial suggestion that, that the two uh, parallel versions that were created for the spans are very close and uh, the aim seemed to have worked and that's further supported by the reliability coefficient in the table over to the right where these are very, very good, uh, you know, very good or excellent um, alternate version test, retest, reliability coefficients. Um, in fact, the best I've seen from perusing um, test manuals, uh, you know, throughout my career. Um, thinking about about uh, the spans is currently normed from age 18 to age 74, and there's plans to extend the upper age range of the norms, but this was essentially these were the ages of the patients that I saw clinically mainly on the rehabilitation wards that I worked on and these four stratifications were clinically driven uh, they are not arbitrary these were decided by uh, the fact that 18 to 32 year olds 33 to 50 year olds and so on and so forth they tend to score about the same and so it, it makes it makes these groups very similar to one another. Um, so it makes them a good uh, comparison band or group to compare people with uh, acquired brain injury to. And um, it is useful uh, as well in in norm when norms are reported that we know about people's uh, age and their education and their IQ, uh, any sort of cultural aspects, and sometimes gender or sex matters as well. And uh, the SPANS uh, manual reports on all of these and also provides some guidance on how to interpret 
uh, people with higher IQ or lower IQ, uh, people with more education or less, and the impact and effect that that has on um, SPAN's performance within the normal population to be able to compare with your patient's um, demographics. So in regards to uh, another aspect that I found myself in on a brain injury rehabilitation ward was that um, often I was interrupted for uh, time for medications or other therapies or uh, my patients coming out of post-traumatic amnesia states uh, not being able to sustain attention for the half hour to 45 minutes that the spans takes. So um, I found it useful to be able to uh, essentially have each subtest norm referenced. So the table over to the right, as you can see, uh, this turned out to be very useful that uh, I can go to the manual if I have just a, s a set number of subtests that I was able to um, administer. I still know from a more norm referenced point of view uh, where my patient um, scored on these um, items compared to a normative sample. And overall for the index scores, as you see, um, provided are T-scores and percentiles. And because the SPANS is uh, negatively skewed, it doesn't, doesn't exactly uh, provide a perfect bell-shaped curve. It's a little bit truncated towards the top end. Um, we have some uh, percentiles here that, that uh, uh, essentially a high score, a high T-score, the top 40% of the norming standardization sample um, scored on particular subtests um, up in the top 40% while the remaining 60% scored somewhere below that. So these are all referenced to the norming sample, and as you see, um, it goes down to below the fifth percentile, uh, with a T-score also below 20. So uh, working on the um, on the uh, ward, it was very very common that my patients would be primarily visually impaired or motor impaired or language impaired or uh, could actually only give uh, a yes and no response such as in locked-in syndrome or something of that nature. So another useful aspect that I needed in the test development was to be able to still have a co-normed comprehensive assessment that if someone was blind or if they were uh, deeply aphasic, I could still do an assessment of a person's orientation, memory, their uh, comprehension, um, some executive functioning of some sort. And so in that, among the 30 subtests, uh, there are tests that have either very low visual demand to them or none very low motor demand or none, and so on and so forth. And the SPANS manual provides um, guidance for um, essentially uh, what tests to administer. And since each subtest is um, norm referenced, it is possible to get a norm referenced uh, um, assessment by taking out for example, all the subtests that the motor requirement is too high for this person who uh, essentially is hemiparetic uh, on their right side, for example. Um, the spans also, as we map the brain um, cortically and subcortically, uh, we know that, that different types of neurological syndromes may occur. The spans also at the beginning includes a visual acuity test, which also picks up on visual uh, neglect. So it's at least possible to 
either fairly thoroughly assess or um, screen um, all of these items that we see pictured here, all of these syndromes. And plus, um, in regard to uh, a lot of my patients had traumatic brain injury, and assessing their post-traumatic amnesia, the duration of it as a uh, predictor of future outcomes, because as we said, the longer someone is disorientated, generally the more uh, challenging or more severe their injury. So um, the SPANS includes um, a uh, three-day recognition memory um, process that helps determine how long um, someone is in post-traumatic amnesia. It's often useful or necessary for people to do shorter assessments, either just to determine whether there is a uh, deficit of some sort or not. So the SPANS provides an, um, suggestions for a five-minute assessment, 15-minute assessment, or tailor-made assessment by um, the clinician's determination. And uh, where psychometrics on these items could be provided, they were. Um, assessing mental capacity is a, is a regular uh, uh, issue. Almost everything is assessing mental capacity. When you're working on a brain injury ward and their decision to self-discharge or accept uh, rehabilitation in dementia as well, dealing with people's finances. So it's helpful to know sort of someone's reasoning ability, their ability to learn and retain information and how they best learn and retain information. Their most, you know, how reliable is their yes and no. All of these things this band provides. Um, assessing mental capacity was very much uh, in my mind when developing uh, subtests. And um, to understand someone's uh, effort that they put in, you know, whether it is due to being depressed or some inadvertent uh, issue or whether it's intentional, uh, the SPANS offers a formula for looking at um, what may be uh, suspicious or what may pass in terms of suggesting that this person put in a good deal of effort or did not. So that's available as well. And so here's the most frequently question, um, asked question that we get, which makes a lot of sense. How, how is the SPANS different from the R bands? And it's a good question. Because both of these tests take about the same amount of time to administer and score. They both have a parallel version and they both purport to um, assess uh, different cognitive domains. Um, essentially, the R bands uh, was first created uh, to differentiate cortical from subcortical dementia. And it differentiates the whole range of cognitive ability. And uh, the SPANS is a little bit different, as we've been seeing. It, it assesses or screens neurological syndromes and perceptual cognitive and language deficits that result from focal or diffuse um, acquired brain injury. So it tends to be, the SPANS tends to be a little bit um, broader. Um, as we said, it's uh, specific and sensitive to cognitive impairments, not trying to get the whole sort of range of cognitive uh, or intellectual capacity. And as a result, uh, the SPANS has 30 shorter subtests and seven index scores, where the uh, R bands has 10 longer subtests and five index scores. And uniquely about each of these tests, uh, you see the list that, that the SPANS offers that the uh, R bands generally does not. And um, the R bands does uh, provide a subtest that assesses uh, semantic fluency. Um, and within the SPANS uh, manual, we uh, have offered guidance on uh, separately um, assessing semantic fluency and phonetic fluency, of which it is much more useful and diagnostically uh, pertinent to assess both phonetic and semantic fluency side by side. And essentially, because the SPANS has more 
more subtests per index. Um, what was achieved is a greater Crumbax alpha. Uh, so at least adequate internal consistency among all the span's index scores, whereas only uh, three out of the five um, R-band scores developed uh, were able to achieve the same. So the SPANS is much more trustworthy in, in regards to uh, trusting that you are measuring what is on the label, essentially. Um, in regard to delayed recall, uh, the R-bands gives uh, the somewhat arbitrary but very standard 30-minute delay time uh, between the learning event and the delayed recall. Um, and the uh, SPANS provides multiple opportunities, multiple points for uh, learning and recall with a much shorter, briefer delay period. It's unclear when, if people are going to forget or uh, uh, that their memory for something is going to deteriorate or they're going to lose a trace of a memory when that occurs. And what is useful about the spans is that because it has these shorter periods of time, it's, it's possible to start and stop, which is sometimes very helpful for patients to be able to take a break or come back to the assessment later. And this did not seem to affect anything, this structure of the spans. We still had very high uh, convergent validity with the gold standard uh, WIMS um, uh, delayed auditory um, recall memory. In regard to areas of development, um, the SPANS has been noticed by a number of people who work in older adult uh, clinical psychology. Um, it's felt that, that it would be useful for um, differential diagnosis of, of dementia, and this is a process that is underway. Uh, we are collecting older adult norms for this um, uh, process, of which uh, very well-known uh, tests of determining type or existence of dementia, the clock drawing tests and semantic and phonetic fluency will be administered uh, co-jointly with uh, the spans for validity reasons and fluency tests will remain as part of a normal assessment uh, with uh, adults over the age of 75. Also, conceptually um, and practically, practically first, there, there isn't currently a brief, short battery comprehensive uh, neuropsychological test for uh, children and adolescents. And conceptually, uh, performance on the spans peaks at around age 24 and then slowly declines from age 74 over the next 50 years. So there is a question about how early in child's development will could the spans be used useful. Um, so there is advice that this could be down to age 11. There's advice that it could be down to age 8. So there will be a study looking into this and practically, eventually, the spans will be made available for uh, children and adolescents. And um, also in regards to learning disabilities, um, those with less than 70 uh, IQ, uh, we're going to be gathering norms for this group so that there will be available a neuropsychological test in which uh, comprehension and learning and uh, conceptual ability more than just an IQ test and adaptive measure will be available. So this is another development that's underway. And finally, we'd just like to suggest that the SPANS, um, we would love to get the SPANS involved in more research, and we believe that it would be uh, very useful for this because of its relatively brief administration and scoring time, that it measures reliably seven cognitive domains, that it's sensitive and specific, and that Essentially, we, there's very good evidence so far that, that it is known what we are measuring when you use uh, the spans, and the equivalent, very highly equivalent parallel versions 
means that if there is an interim intervention or research needs to look at time point A and time point B, this is sort of the, the most reliable and useful way to test and retest. So I believe that may be it. Yep. Thank you, thank you very much, Terry. Um, I'm just taking this back over, and uh, just a brief reminder that you are more than welcome to uh, either write in your questions on the little question panel below, um, but additionally, you can sort of um, raise your little icon hand, and I'm more than happy to um, take questions over the microphone if you prefer to speak them out. Um, Jerry, I do have one question that's been written in while you were speaking. Uh, and that is in uh, regards to the norms. How many people was this normed on, and when did you decide that uh, that you had enough norms? Um, I missed the last part of the question, unfortunately. But I think I think it was about uh, how many norms are there. We have in the range of two hundred and sixty norms overall that cover the span from age 18 to age 74. And according to the BPS, that's uh, considered adequate at the moment to uh, have a sense of, of, uh, uh, of uh, reasonable um, error variance within a, within a norm population. And uh, I'm sorry, Jamie, what was the last part of the question? Sorry about that, Jerry. That's, um the last part of the question was just in regards to uh, how you knew when you were finished norming. Um, did you did you set out to norm a certain uh, number of individuals? Yes. Yes. So, and so, so I guess with with that um, uh, to get into the adequate uh, range and get the spans out there where it can be used and useful to people, um, that was a name. The uh, norms performed so predictably and so usefully that, that also this adequate number um, suggested by the BPS seems to function quite well. I think it's going to be uh, a different story as people age and we do the over 75 um, uh, norming study because uh, variance expands uh, very much as people pass the age of 75, so we will meet, need more norms for that particular age group. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, I have another one that's just written in. Um, thanks to Jerry, and you mentioned that the assessment was normed on independent, healthy individuals. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about how and where you recruited those individuals. The people who are, uh, make up the norm sample. Um, at first, they were uh, family members of uh, patients um, on the brain injury ward. Uh, they were collected as uh, acquaintances of um, a team of 10 assistant psychologists that uh, worked with me. Um, this sometimes included friends and family and sometimes included uh, going to a club or group uh, and asking for people to participate to be a norm. Um, one thing that I did find is that, that uh, generally people who tend to like test or uh, cognitive games were much more likely to put their hands up and say yes they would. So it was very useful that we collected um, an IQ estimate uh, on uh, the initial norms that we collected, and that way we were able to use those in the uh, validation studies and kind of understand what is uh, normal, which was borne out um, as we continued to collect more and more norms. It was a very reliable and useful, predictable uh, norm gathering process.